I'm Mark Gagan, and you're listening to the Voice of Insurance podcast, produced in association with Advantage Go, enabling enterprise scale underwriting through a single pane of glass. Innovation. We keep reading about it. We keep getting harangued at conferences to do more of it. We also keep getting told that innovation is really hard to do in insurance. But is it? After all, innovation used to happen perfectly naturally and organically in the past. It's only in the last decade that we've started to take the business of innovation seriously and given it its own department and made people responsible and accountable for making it happen. What have we learned so far? Meet today's guest, Tom Hode. Tom is Head of Innovation at Tokyo Marine Kiln and has been in the role since late 2015. That's a lot of accumulated knowledge about how to go about implanting new ideas into insurance. Tom is bursting with energy and enthusiasm, and this podcast packs in a huge amount of learning into a very short time. We start the conversation by running through one of TMK's latest product launches in the clean energy space. This is a really great sounding idea and is what brought Tom to my attention again recently and reminded me to get him on the show. But soon the discussion develops into a really broad one that harnesses all that Tom has learnt about the art and science of bringing exciting new insurance products to market. It's full of mind-expanding and very useful bits of knowledge that Tom has learnt from six and a half years at the bleeding edge. Anyone who wants to improve their innovation hit rate will find this a fascinating and really useful listen. Enjoy the podcast. Tom, welcome to The Voice of Insurance. Well, thanks very much for having me. One of the things that caught my eye was one of your latest innovations, Tom. It's a collaboration with a business called Altelium. Can you give us a bit of a rundown on what all that's about? Yeah, sure. I think it really starts with the way that the UK and other countries are transitioning to the low carbon economy. And that's all about making sure that in the energy mix that your wind and solar assets are actually being able to provide electricity to the grid at peak times so that at a grid level, your energy reliance on oil and gas and otherwise CO2 polluting assets is less because batteries themselves can pick up the slack in the system. And I think with that in mind, what's been happening concurrently is over the years, as you've seen, there's been a large number of hybrid cars and otherwise electrified cars. And the batteries in those motors are reaching the end of their useful life for cars. And so what that means is that you have this unique opportunity to marry up second life batteries, so you literally use batteries, and the needs of renewable energy assets to store electricity to create capital gains on the way in which they use their own assets, but also to help store electricity to produce it back to the grid when the grid needs it most. And that creates an economic argument to install these things on wind and solar projects. And Altelium has done extensive research as a company with Lancaster University and has a ton of different people with loads of expertise around batteries that as an insurer, we can use those skills to help us understand and and understand how batteries are going to degrade over time. So this is getting a whole load of old beaten up Uber drivers, Mark 1 Priuses, their batteries are not very useful anymore, and turning them to big arrays that are really useful on those really, of course, the days that when we've got fantastic amount of wind power, for example, in the UK, but of course, in that one week in the middle of winter, when it's really, really cold, is when there's no wind. Yeah, it's unbelievably sophisticated, actually. These things typically sort of end up being strung together in container-sized things, and what they are is managed so that they interact with the grid. So there's a relationship directly with, for example, EDF and actually the battery itself so that EDF can use the battery if it needs to from time to time when it's not storing electricity from the wind project. And the wind project can also store electricity in there from the wind when, in fact, the grid doesn't need it at that point in time. So it's this amazing way of storing electricity for new renewable energy. And this is the industrial scale. Yeah, it can be. Yeah, These things that we're doing at the moment are relatively low scale, but they are designed that way so that we can learn from them and start understanding how the insurance needs of them are going to evolve over time. And where's the insurance part kicking in there? Yeah, so in this area, what you get are projects looking to onboard battery energy storage solutions. And what that means is they want to make sure that these systems themselves are going to be robust over a five, six, seven year period. So what they ask the person selling these systems to do is to stand up a guarantee. That typically has to include an element of what state of health of the battery is going to be in over time. And off the back of that guarantee, that's where the insurance warranty comes in. So we actually insure the guarantee via a warranty insurance product. 
So you're really there to give comfort to the financier, the lender, usually? It's to a range of different stakeholders. But yes, it's that economic backstop behind things going wrong in these systems, which you hope enables further use of them across the UK and, and in the US and beyond. So it's guaranteeing, I don't know, say if a battery is degraded after 20 years in a car down to 40% of what it used to be when it was brand new. Yeah. You're sort of saying, okay, over, the, over this five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten year, which is probably the payback period that these investors require. Yeah you're going to guarantee they won't go below 20 or something? Or is it kind of like a stop loss? It's like you go from 20 yeah. to 16 and then they're back on their own again. So the good thing is like for us, Altilium really are the experts in this area. So we sort of outsource and really benefit in the partnership with them around the technical exposure profile of the batteries. There's an enormous amount of complexity in electrochemical degradation over time. They also need to be reviewed all the time because depending on how hot they are, how much they're used, what kind of moisture's in the air, all those sorts of things, they all affect it. So if you, if you think about your mobile phone that I can see on the desk over there, you know, we've all had problems with our phones where suddenly you can't charge them as well. Well, that's all about the way by which that you look after your battery and, and you use the battery system itself. And so understanding that is what Altelium helps us do. So they tell us what the battery's likely to degrade at from the outset, but then they also constantly monitor via real life APIs to the client what that battery condition is and how it's being used and what kind of conditions it's being used in. So as an insurer, you're just getting comfortable with their level of expertise and then you give yourself a bit of a buffer, I presume, as well, yeah. and then just be comfortable with that and then off you go. Yeah, that's pretty much right. The client as well, we have to be comfortable with the client. And on the ones that we're currently insuring, we're very comfortable that the client knows exactly what they're doing as well. Yeah, so in your mind, what's the sort of insurance problems you're wishing to overcome? Is moral hazard lurking around there? Yeah, and I think, you know, with any warranty, I mean, these ones are typically five years. You've got this relationship between what needs to be covered off and the projections over time. So in this system, I think without knowing how they're going to be controlled and managed throughout the currency of the insurance policy, you as an insurer would have some real risk, especially towards the latter years, that perhaps they weren't being used in the right way. And what Altelium solves for us is that problem. It's the control layer above it that alerts the client if things have gone wrong, but also alerts us if things are looking like they're not complying with the terms and conditions of the insurance. And what sort of scope is this? Is this a UK project? And UK, US focused. At the moment, it's UK, but you know, with plans to launch in the US relatively shortly. And so in terms of the sort of size, is it something that's like to be relatively small in premium terms? So with all incubation of risk, which is my area, you want to start small. And we want to partner with companies like Altelium, who provide us that sort of level of skill and expertise that enables us to get into the sector. But the growth potential on this is enormous. So it's not just battery energy storage systems. The best is that we're talking about is also electric vehicles and, and how that market might develop as well. Because it sounds relatively short tail compared to some of the long term guarantees that I've seen in the market, say for solar panel, a bit like industrial scale, photovoltaic generation, for example, with things like 15 to 20 year periods. This seems a bit shorter. Yeah. And it comes back to your point earlier around the financing. So these things typically end up being relatively small capex comparative to what they do. And actually, the tenor on the debt is actually relatively short term as well. And to your point you made earlier, actually, the latter years really help reinvigorate the financing, by new batteries or new secondhand batteries and so on and so forth. It's all it's really around the project economics rather than anything else. And I suppose, is that something that's an ideal characteristic of you being able to embed yourself effectively in that so to help enable it to do more? Yeah, I mean, this is where Take Me Encounter is very focused. I mean, we're trying to help transition to the low carbon economy by a range of means one of which is through product development and partnerships that enable us to tackle difficult problems for clients. So I think this is a great example of where we've practically put that into commercial practice and, and actually we're looking forward to that partnership growing over time. You've been in the innovation space probably longer than anybody. Probably I would say TMK was one of the first businesses, certainly in the London market, to actually label something as innovation and you were given that job as being head of innovation. And that's probably six, seven years ago now. How has your method as being this innovator in innovation, how has your experience honed your methodology in the way you go about things and give yourself a higher percentage chance of getting projects off the ground? Yeah, it's a very tricky sector, actually. I mean, the first thing is having a head of innovation. It's something that people tend to get rid of after two years. So how I've been here for six, seven, I've no idea. But at the same time, I think the role itself in Kiln is really singing to the values of the company. So one of our core values is innovation. And although we don't have a head of integrity, for example, 
in the innovation piece, there is a key deliverable around product that Kiln's particularly focused on. So since its inception in 1962, we've been known as a bit of an innovative marketplace. I think my role is really a natural evolution of the need to capitalize on that, given the kind of accelerated growth that we see going on around us. Now, to answer your question in more detail, the system of how you do it is actually quite complicated. And it involves thinking about where you get ideas from, how those themes themselves, so for example, transition to low carbon economy or our client's adoption of technology and its implications for insurance, or indeed short tail non-damage business interruption, but from a range of causes outside of normal property damage. How do you then focus your research into those areas to understand how the clients are dealing with them? And then from that, what do you then do with the cascade of lots of different activities that need to happen to launch a product like the Artelian one? So, I mean, where do you want me to start? It's the kind of question back well, from so me. Well, so the first thing is, does just actually labelling something make people think about innovation more? Just the fact that you've got innovation make people think, oh, goodness, I never really thought about innovation in the other departments. You know? I think it actually causes all sorts of problems. I think you, you put the word innovation on something and naturally have people have expectations of blue sky thinking, me running around on a Segway and all sorts of things not really happening particularly Robots well. And right? And actually, the practice of innovation is really about doing stuff. It's not innovation. It's a combination of problem solving, collaborating, experimenting, and linking between what insurance can do and what our clients want to do together. So for me personally, I'm actually not a fan of the word innovation. I'm more a fan of the activities surrounding what you need to do to be innovative. Is the biggest problem things like siloing? Does all the other departments look at you and say, oh, no, it's Tom, he's come from meeting. That means he wants to sit on my profit and loss account and he's going to ruin my bonus this year if his <laughs> battery scheme goes wrong, for example. Yeah. How have you managed to get over that? Have you created your own sort of P&L separately so that you don't hurt any of the core businesses who are sort of, you know, jealously guarding their own bonuses, for example? Yeah, so there's nice bait in that question. I think that from Kiln's perspective, Kiln has decided to specifically delineate between innovation or as we call it incubation underwriting and normal sort of BAU underwriting. Now BAU really downplays the technical expertise in that area but it's the core underwriting platform. So the way that we look at it is that innovation or incubation underwriting needs to be done in such a way so as to not have really a material impact on the overall P&L and that's an important step. So you've got to keep it small enough to make it not too painful. And also that's how innovation works. You build a product, you take it to market, you test it in commercial practice, you tinker with it, you change it. There's a model typically, and then there's also modeled losses and non-modeled losses. So what you want to do is contain the experiment in its early phases so that you can learn from it, you can learn how commercially it's beginning to behave, and then you can kind of interact and tailor with it. So that's the genesis of how that kind of comes And when to you have market. a product, do you have an idea of which department it's going to fly off to if it becomes yeah, it's a fledging product and it gets its wings? Yes. And you already have a pre-plan, so well, this is obviously going to be a property product, this is going to be So that, I find that quite difficult, actually. So for me, your question around silos is an interesting one. I wouldn't see them as silos. I'd see them as areas of specific subject matter expertise. So if you're taking a new product to market and you happen to have, for example, a property underwriter with enormous knowledge around property damage, business interruption, and your project involves elements of that, it would be really foolish not to go and ask them what their thoughts were on it. So the first thing is you want that interaction. And I don't really mind how painful that is. And at Kiln, I don't think it is particularly painful. But that conversation is a necessary part of going to market. You're seeking counsel from those with experience. So what you get are, oh, have you thought about this issue, which is actually something we've known about for 20 years, but you be going to market with an innovation project which is stupid enough to not solve that issue and actually fall foul of it. So you want that sort of stuff. But you also want to ignore certain things. So there are some things that happen. It could be political or they could be timing or they could be other issues that you as the innovator, as it were, have to kind of be able to sort of be strong enough to say, like, I accept that point, but it's not actually relevant for what I'm doing. So the skill is in taking the knowledge and the expertise from the subject matter expert, but then doing an innovation experiment in a controlled way so it doesn't hurt the organization if it goes wrong, so that then you can observe and learn from it over time to be perfectly placed to follow it up as it begins to scale. So you can overcome any perhaps ingrained prejudices. Of yeah, I know what you're getting at. And I think that the Lloyd's market generally has had some huge sort of issues with siloization. And actually, you can see why. We're effectively a large metaphorical fruit and vegetable marketplace where people are selling apples, bananas, pears, and oranges. So 
people think in terms of apples or bananas or pears. And if you come to them with a kumquat or a kiwi fruit, they're going to sort of say, well, what is it? How does it work? And to try and apply a kind of a pear terminology to a kumquat. And the whole <laughs> thing then sort of starts to unravel rather badly. And well, you come in with a great big smoothie maker and say, right, come on, here we go. Well, quite. But isn't this what a marketplace should be doing? Rather than just selling apples, bananas, pears and oranges, <laughs> we should be selling smoothies. We should be selling sliced fruit. We should be selling mixtures of things that no one's ever done before. And frankly, we should be out trying to look for new fruit and vegetables all the time. And that is what I think a sustainable market looks like. And that, I think, is part of my role to lead the charge on that, not just at Kiln, but also in the market, collaborating with my peers. I'd like you to explain, we've got this wider innovation group, the Lloyd's Project launch pad, there was, it was called, there was the, um, the P PIF. The PIF. Yeah. What does the PIF stand for again? Well, too? I've been told off because I'm terrible at naming things. So I called it, it was the Product Innovation Facility. And that actually, was it, Product I'm glad Innovation you asked me Facility. That, I didn't tell you I was going to bring this, but I've actually got the original slip from having built that. So you lot won't be able to see this on the podcast, but this was put together. I spoke to a broker at Bowood around this in 2019. And we basically just decided that as a market, we ought to sort of collaborate in a pre-competitive environment to sort of suit our clients' needs by working together to pull capacity to tackle difficult problems, right? Sounds like an easy thing to do. In practice, as you'll see, what I did was I stamped this slip, which actually, to be honest, doesn't say a huge amount. And then it was followed by 27 markets. So at the end of that, we ended up with 150 million of capacity. It's full of five million pound lines. I well, guess quite. You. And that's the point of this is point of Lloyd's. So this is syndication in practice. And in particular, a bit like when we wrote the Titanic together, thank goodness we did it as a team rather than any one market going, oh, it's unsinkable. Right. I'll have 100 percent, please. So in innovation terms, that is the right methodology, I think. And I think Lloyd's in particular is in this amazingly unique position to capitalize on that globally. And I think that's what the power of Lloyd's can be for the future as well. So this is particularly interesting. And one side anecdote here, when I was growing up at Miller, when I was a broker, Dominic Hoare at Munich Re was a kind of revered oil and gas upstream energy. Well, guy. I think he still is. Well, quite. And, and apologies, Dominic, this is about <laughs> you. Anyway, so it amused me that in my broking career, he was the first person who would be on the slip. And I hope you won't mind me saying it, but he's almost second to last on this one. So that <laughs> amused me in, in my world as well. So that idea, again, seeing that Lloyd's is a great place to do this because you can all take small chunks and then together do something quite meaningful. Is that very much part of your DNA saying this is definitely a Lloyd's thing as well as being a TMK thing? Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's part of why in the, something like the Tokyo Marine Group, you want your Tokyo Marine Kiln element to have that sort of interaction with the marketplace. Because I will lead stuff, but I'll also follow things in Lloyd's. I'll lead initiatives and I'll follow initiatives as well. So they could be R&D activities. They could be talking about autonomous driving, all sorts of different things. So in that ecosystem, it's prolific. It's like this amazing artisanal cottage industry that actually has a bunch of super bright people collaborating where, where it suits them to do so to solve client problems. And part of my role and my career has been about proliferating that and making sure Lloyds understands that that's near the top of the agenda, which they absolutely do. In particular, John Neal, who was responsible mostly for the 2% innovation class, which allows up to about 700 million of premium to be permissible for innovation purposes every single year at Lloyd's. So I think it's things like that that actually make the ecosystem super attractive. And the syndication of risk in its early phases, where you don't really know exactly how it's going to work out, is absolutely best practice. And as you scale that, you release aggregate, you release the PML, you, you start scaling up with the product. And the markets that got in early are the ones that should be riding that up the curve as it begins to become an asset like you would expect many of these things to do. I had George Beatty on the show recently. He didn't seem to think there's any shortage of ideas out there. He said it was a raging torrent of ideas yeah. and you just had to dip your bucket in every now and again. It was full before you knew it. Yeah. Would you agree with that? Yes, I agree with that. I think I've described it internally as a bit like if you had a small plastic cup and you were standing under Niagara Falls, you could fill it up rather easily with opportunity. I think that's absolutely right. But I think what George means, if, if I might be so bold, is that there's no shortage of ideas, right? But actually turning an idea into an insurance product is a hell of a journey. It requires a lot of commitment. It requires a lot of thinking through. It requires actually quite a lot of sign-off, some of which is completely necessary, 
other events is just to kind of make sure that people have been engaged along the way because they may need to think about it later on and so on and so forth. So the delivery of that, you're talking about a cascade of possibly, I mean, I reckon we see about three to five inquiries a day at Kiln. And of that, we're probably doing one a month product launches at the moment with both Kiln and the group. So from our perspective, that's quite a big ratio of things you could do to what you actually and do. And what's the speed from day one being yeah, so shown something it to depends, product? Right? Classic answer, but we can go to market in four weeks. Often we don't because there are issues we need to resolve and hurdles we need to get through. But yeah, we're, I think we can do it in four weeks. How is that oversight? Obviously, some of that's very, very necessary. We're a regulated industry, obviously, for very good reasons. But do you feel that that balance is about right? So getting that balance right is all about culture and process, actually. And insurers have, at the moment, a kind of typical culture and process that supports the short-term combined ratio, right? And that is absolutely necessary for all sorts of reasons, regulators, financial health, all sorts of things, right? Well, let's face it, that's hard enough. <laughs> yeah, exactly, right. So then you get to the innovation piece. And what you'll find is, if anyone's listening to this who does underwriting in this area, or indeed broking, same thing, is that what you're talking about are things that are low income, possibly volatile results, and involve a whole load of quite needy startups and other people in the chain to get these things to happen. And so it does not fit. It just does not fit. And so in practice, what you're trying to do is you're trying to make sure that from a cultural standpoint, the exec have got enough of an ambidexterity about them to say, you know what, we're doing the short term combined ratio. Everyone's 100% focused on that. But there's space in the organization for those people to lend their expertise to the process of innovation. And what I find is that you get people from, for example, wordings, conduct, could be data, could be wherever in the business, who are getting quite good now at sort of saying, look, I'll take my hat off that says governance and control, and I'll be more of an advisor to new things. And in that role, what I'm doing is making sure that the economic downside to these things is super controlled so that if it does go wrong, then actually it's not material to the business. Obviously, you've got a methodology and you've honed that in terms of what are the first 20 questions and 20 quick hurdles you can get through before you think, actually, this can go to the final judging panel to say, this is definitely potentially a viable product. At least I can get rid of 90% of everything by answering these 20 questions because if they can't answer them correctly, they're off. Yeah. Have you got any better at finding, obviously, we talk about innovation, particularly from the tech side of things, the vernacular is always about fast fail. Mm -hmm. And be able to try lots and lots of things, kiss lots of frogs, and then some of them turn into a handsome prince and most of them yeah. don't. And be able to decide quite quickly which ones are just frogs. Yeah, so I actually don't agree with a lot of that. The bit around having the 20 questions is completely erroneous. So you, I don't believe you can look at it that way. I think the first thing is you're trying to find a team of people with some skills that you don't have. And then what you're doing is you're actually trying to keep the circle of trust very small. So it would typically be me, them, and a couple of others from Kiln trying to understand what the hurdles are. And they will be a myriad of different problems, ranging from how you model it to how you control aggregate to how you deal with conduct. However you deal with it, there are going to be problems. And then what you're doing as the corporate is you are literally partnering, like in a proper partnership way, to solve these problems with the startup typically. And by doing that, you learn so much. I mean, we get so much sort of secondary derived innovation from doing product innovation. We've learned about natural language processing. We've learned about all sorts of ways of using IoT data. All these different things have come from delivering on products that have had these secondary outcomes. Anyway, back to the point. I think it's really not templated. It's more of a feel for does it fit? Can it fit? How will it fit? And I've spent 11 years at Kiln doing this stuff working out what I think will work. I brought 30 products to market. I have a lot of experience in working out whether they're going to work or not. And to be honest with you, a lot of the barriers that insurers put up are actually completely superfluous because the key question is, does it actually help a client? And does it sell? Because you can come to market with a new product, but if it doesn't sell, it's not a new product. It's just an idea you've thrown out into society to sort of say, look, we're doing this, right? The real skill is to say, we sold one iteration, Two, it's a coincidence. And three, it's kind of like a trend. And then at that point, you're like, okay, now we've possibly got something that's beginning to scale and we can kind of get So you're much it. more bottom up. You're really demand driven. You absolutely want to be bottom up from what the client wants. And you absolutely want to control the like, experimentation phase so that when you've got losses, that actually they're contained, they're measurable, and you can iterate the product from them. So you want to learn things like, we thought the product meant this. 
the client said, we interpreted the product like this, pay our claim. We tend to then pay the claim and then we tend to work on the product to make sure it's actually more robust in the future and actually work out how to do that properly. So you've produced quite a lot of product. Loads. A lot of them haven't sold, to be um, perfectly yeah. honest. No, no, that's fine. Do you have any particular favourites, ones that you can sort of pin up on the wall and l say, this is my favourite child so far? Yeah, I mean, they're all my favourite child for a short <laughs> period of time, to be honest. But I think the way that I would answer that is, I can tell you, honestly, hand on heart, a Sunday evening, sitting at home, thinking about work on a Monday, I'm not the sort of person who goes, God, this is going to be awful. I'm thinking about so many different things flying around my own head so many different partnerships, relationships, skills we can learn as a business, so many different opportunities. And when they go to market, I celebrate with these companies. So Parametrics, they launched their product and we did a kind of parametric cloud outage product. The first deal is great. It's elation. It's like, we've done it. People want this. We built something that people want. And Parametrics did a fantastic job on that. It's things like that, that you want to be on that journey with them on. And it's just a really rewarding way of doing it. But the interesting dichotomy, and I feel that there's an economic solution somewhere here to this, is that you need a parent company like Tokyo Marine who really does think about the really long term because in the first phases of this stuff, you're in the product nascency, you're there, you're in the trenches dealing with problems. And to a CUO, this is low income, what's the result, how's it going to hurt me stuff, not, wow, this is so exciting, this is how I'm going to build a portfolio to make a 90% combined ratio. So. It's interesting how you put that together and, and how you kind of feed off it. What was the detail on the parametrics? What was that? Obviously, it's, oh, it's a great product. So, I mean, basically, it's an Israeli startup with some really fantastic people in it. And they, uh, they observe cloud outage at kind of a global level. Oh, right. Yeah, that must be amazing. So they created a data set from which we could then work with them to understand the likely losses and the sort of severity of these incidents. And then we went to market with them on a product where we supported their product build and design with underwriting. And, and we put some insurance capacity behind them. And, you know, that product's going from strength to strength. And it's also giving us all sorts of into different types of products that Parametrics are trying to come up with for cloud computing and all sorts of networks surrounding it. But on that one, it's basically clients who are reliant on the cloud who trade 24-7 if the cloud goes down, they lose income. So, you know, where's the insurance? And that's sort of a cyber exclusion, isn't it? Or well, cyber, cyber typically. I mean, you yeah. know, cyber, there are various versions of cyber in the market, but typically you're talking about eight-hour waiting periods for business interruption. And also, you know, nowadays with cyber, I think there are permutations of coverage that typically try and minimize the RDS scenarios of this sort of thing. So how much cloud exposure you've got, how much are we limiting that, and so on and so forth. That sounds like a really, really good product. And then what have you learned from the ones that haven't worked out? Is it really just about selling more important so selling is critical i can't underplay it but it's not just sales as in growth it's also how you sell what you don't want to do is you don't want to go to market and be so obsessed with sales that you miss sell and i couldn't stress this enough you want proper decent brokers working with you and we're very lucky in london to have a ton of those around us which is great it's really around curating the sort of sales part of it. I mean, stuff that I've done before, I've had products go to market where I think, you know, this is really going to work. Everyone seems to want this. And then what you typically get is a client sort of saying, oh, well, it's kind of interesting, but like I need to save some money from my existing insurance program. So what can I take out of that to put into this? And then on top of that, it's always around dollar swapping around budgets and so on and so forth. So my main learning from that was, Always try and design insurance to enable a client to do something else. Always try and design it so that they've got an ability to use that insurance to give them some form of otherwise contingent liability in their balance sheet alleviation or some way of signaling to their clients that actually, look, they're so robust in this methodology that there's an insurer also protecting them from things. It's just those embedded ones that tend to work because... It's part of a package. Embedded works as part of a package. They tend to be simple innovations and they tend to be things that can be done. I mean, we started adding, for example, reputational type losses to cyber about seven or eight years ago. And that was a good extension because obviously the relationship between reputational damage and cyber was very strong. But similarly, I think we wouldn't have got to that so easily if we hadn't put decades into how do you handle reputational risk? What's the insurance product for it? And how does that actually fit together? It's interesting what you say about being demand-led. The client usually has a set budget. 
I remember after KRW speaking to reinsurance brokers saying, well, hey, you guys are going to be absolutely minted. The price of cat reinsurance just doubled. Surely your brokerage is going to double. And they said, it's not as simple as that because yeah. actually the, their budget, they're just going to buy half as much reinsurance. We're just going to find ways of getting the most efficient spend because their spend hasn't changed because they don't budget. Yeah. They have fairly fixed budgets. Yeah. I mean, I spend a lot of time, as you can imagine, with the risk management community. And I think generally there are some systemic risks that I don't deal with, right? So innovation does not deal with this. And I can't say that. And actually there are limitations in the private market relating to some of the macro systemic issues, right? But at the same time, I think risk managers today have this sort of cognizance around them that sort of says, I'm not just managing risk. I'm also protecting the company from a range of changes that happen in society around us and that I need to be at the forefront of understanding that. And I've got hopefully she would agree, but a very good relationship with Judah Graham at Airmic on this basis, where we and the wider community of her stakeholders, we chat relatively regularly around, well, what are we going to do about this? And of course, insurance, respectfully, is probably the last thing you think about. You're actually thinking about risk tech. You're thinking about new ways of dealing with problems. You're talking about legal frameworks, all sorts of things. And as an innovator, insurance innovator, I need to be in the weeds on some of that to understand how insurance can actually apply. And in fact, whether or not it can apply full stop. So it's a fascinating area to be involved. It's always moving. You mentioned brokers a couple of times. Obviously, you, you went around Lloyd's with a Bowood slip, so yeah. presumably with a broker holding onto it. There's another story. And also, yeah. so how big a deal is it? Obviously, this is a brokered market. So mm-hmm. presumably the broker is really key to all of this. Yeah. My take on Lloyd's is as follows. It's a wholesale marketplace that's over the years provide incredible services around the world for basically excess and surplus lines and other things like that the Lloyd's market is known for. But I think it has this sort of secondary evolution associated with it, which is where I think I'm trying to help steward some of the thinking in the marketplaces. And when that's really around, look, this syndicated model has applications beyond the traditional model and the traditional application of it. And I think what I'm doing with my colleagues in Lloyd's and beyond is to try to say, look, this is the right platform to collaborate within to really launch a ton of products that actually do something meaningful for clients. And I think in that model of Lloyd's, you're talking about if you see it as a trivial pursuit wheel, the large Lloyd's got many, many cheeses, right? And the innovation piece has probably got just as many cheeses, but the actual risks it's tackling and the exposure it's tackling is much, much smaller. And you do that because if things go wrong, then actually you've syndicated it and actually everyone's grown up about it, but the losses could be more like tens of thousands rather than millions. And I think in that model, you can then curate new product, test it, bring it to market, evolve it, iterate it, and scale it up in the right way. And I believe that's the right way of doing this sort of thing. And I think that's largely what the future of Lloyd's is all about. And you feel you've got real buy-in from brokers, big and small. Right. So absolutely. But I think there are, like there are on the insurance side, issues around well, what are our most valuable people doing? And that sort of argument, a lot of what's happening is in the marketplace, the most valuable people tend to be doing the biggest income, the most likely results and the short term P&L. And from my perspective, that is a sort of a symptom of a marketplace that is sort of lagging behind where it should be, because some of this stuff requires some of the best people to be putting their heads together and actually solve these problems like I think Kiln is doing. And I think by doing that and setting up a platform for it, we need to really think around what are the economic benefits of doing that over the longer term. Innovation stuff generally doesn't tend to pay off within a one to three year period, which is the same planning period that most Lloyd syndicates and London markets are planning what their portfolio is going to look like. And a secondary issue with that is that if you're planning what your portfolio is going to be looked like for the next one to three years, you do not know that in five years' time you're going to have less property or less marine. So you don't know what you want from innovation. So trying to tell innovation what to do now based on a one to three year projection is also relatively futile. So I think this syndication model helps get through some of those kind of hurdles to market and it helps people focus on the importance of trialing new things because you don't know whether they're going to be assets until they really are. Do you think we've got enough reward? I suppose if we were in Silicon Valley, we would have that intellectual property. Yeah. Is there enough intellect IP within insurance? Because it seems to be too easily copyable once it's... uh... Well, I mean, I'm delighted to see a sort of a VC community beginning to emerge in London, actually. Venture capital is the kind of traditional methodology to really accelerate innovation, right? So from my perspective, 
it's great to see a lot of VCs now focusing on product insure tech. And just to give you an example of how difficult that is, if you're doing normal VC style stuff, you might be looking at a restaurant, for example, you take it to market, and that's great. Now, imagine that the kind of food and drink that you're supplying at the restaurant is the equivalent of underwriting capacity. What VC would get behind a restaurant that didn't have food and drink? I can tell you, none. So in the insurance sector, I don't think it is about IP, actually. I think it's about making sure you've got an alignment between both capacity and funding to actually curate the right platform for people to come in, be financially supported, and to have the right level of supply so they can take their restaurant to market and hopefully get some great write-ups on all the right websites and so on and so forth, so you can then scale it from that perspective. Last couple of questions would be, with all your experience, are there any common elements, some things that you see that get you really excited, where it kind of gets your hair standing on end and gets your sort of sixth sense going to say, these are elements that I've identified that have been common to all of the successful things I've done so far? I'm going to contribute to the long-term sustainability of the Lloyds and London market. And in doing that, I need to be fully aligned by all of the different components of that marketplace. And what gets me really excited is when we build on this innovation. I think it's like a new wave. You know, It's a new wave of things happening at Lloyds. And I think what gets me really excited is seeing when brokers get it, when underwriters get it, when venture capital gets it, and you start getting a really cool amount of really useful startups coming to market. I mean, the Lloyds Lab's been absolutely fantastic for that. And I think it's really the lab of labs for me. It's, it's kind of an environment where we can all come together and the pipeline opportunities is very large and they have the right infrastructure and warehousing capabilities to bring together the marketplace around it. So yeah, for me, it's that. And roughly, where's your gut feel telling you that from what sort of sectors and what sort of types of product are going to be the most exciting ones and the ones that are really going to explode in the next five to 10 years? Well, the key is the relative merit of the product to the insurance sector, as well as the relative merit of the product to the clients. And it's really that kind of almost bow tie shape that's kind of critical. So of what the clients want, the insurance market will probably loathe to be doing sort of unlimited in time stop losses, do loads and loads of credit risk, macroeconomic risk, all that sort of stuff. However, assets that add, as we talked about earlier, my fruit and vegetable analogy, a kumquat and a kiwi fruit to the portfolio, that's likely to be more attractive. So on the client side, you kind of have to, unfortunately, shy away a little bit from some of the things that the market can't do as a private sector. And then on the insurer side, I think what's very exciting is this enormous wall of capital behind the transition to the low carbon economy. And I think the innovation that's coming out of that sector alone is absolutely fantastic. So we did an experiment with carbon chain, looking to carbon score our portfolio. And there are other things like that that we've been doing to kind of understand the sector. And I think that that's a key bit. I also think that this proliferation of internet things and the real-time value of risk and dynamic underwriting is a massive area. So we're supporting an insured tech that's looking at trucking and using IoT-related things. I mean, it's down to the fact that you now get cameras in these truck cabins where they're actually looking at eye movements, whether people look at their phones, all this sort of stuff in real time. And these are really important risk indicators, right? So we're looking at that. We're looking at that for shipping and how that comes together. So there's so many different bits there that come together under the technology banner. And then a favorite bastion of mine, I'm afraid, is about intangibles and how, as society changes, we move from the bricks and mortar through to the more human-made errors that we can then try and find insurance for. So acts of God to acts of man and trying to put around that the right sort of intellectual capacity to stimulate thinking around product, who's going to deliver it, how they're going to deliver it, what does that need to look like, and what does society need in general around it? So it's those three areas, really. The reputational risk it hasn't really ignited. No. It's been around for a while, but yeah. do you think it's a bit like cyber? It's been around for a long time, and then finally it yeah. just started to wake up, and then it just exploded. Do you think it's a sort of slumbering giant that will be woken? I've been doggedly trying to work out what to do with reputation for a decade. There's some great initiatives. So there are parametric type solutions in that area that simplify it. There are non-damage business interruption indemnity style solutions out there that attempt to get it and they tend to couple with crisis response, but also like looking at your brand and observing it in real time and things like that. I think that what's most likely is where you get this high level of brand equity, whether or not that's related to a, a human being or to a luxury goods company or whatever it is, 
I think where you've got high brand equity, there are solutions that are viable. And, you know, we've sold in those areas. But I think that alongside that, what seems to be happening is the clients, a bit like in Moneyball, where baseball started becoming more data orientated. I think the amount of data around that now is really enabling us to sort of segment areas of that risk that then can be insurable and that have a tangible benefit to people in the ecosystem. But to answer your question, I still think reputation is a valuable R&D area, but cyber was triggered by legislative change, which helped it get to market in the way that it did. Reputation doesn't yet have that, but who knows what society holds in that area over the next five to 10 years. So I would take from all of this that you're pretty optimistic that the future's going to be brighter than, than the past. Oh, absolutely. And why wouldn't you be? <laughs> I've really, really enjoyed talking to you, Tom. For anyone who's sort of jaded with the, the day-to-day and grind of that day-to-day P&L to cleanse the mind and think a bit more about the future and about the long-term products of the future, I've really, really enjoyed talking to you. It's been very energising. So thanks very much. Well, thanks for having me. Well, I hope you enjoyed today's episode. If you did, Don't forget to subscribe or leave a like or a review or recommendation on whatever podcast platform you used to access this program. These really help get the word out. Before we go, just a quick reminder that advertising slots are available here and in other places in the Voice of Insurance podcasts. Podcasting is the fastest growing medium and attracts a high quality audience of key decision makers. It's also an intimate medium where you, the listener, are right in the room with me and the interview subjects. Needless to say, that means it's a great way of getting your message out directly to an audience because you know you've got their full attention. It's also very cost effective. So get in touch with Mark at thevoiceofinsurance.com to find out how you could be speaking directly to the industry. The Voice of Insurance podcast is produced in association with Advantage Go, enabling enterprise scale underwriting through a single pane of glass. Voice of Insurance is produced by me, Mark Gagan. Music was written by Anna Gagan and produced by Carlos Gagan. Check out more podcasts and written comment pieces at www.thevoiceofinsurance.com. <laughs>